All right, so um, this is going to be quick and painless um, and hopefully interesting for those of you who are not really familiar with corrections. So um, my, my research area is actually um, pretty focused when it comes to corrections. Um, I focus very much on treatment of offenders and whether the, their treatment is um, you know, effective or not. And as part of those, um, risk assessment is one of those um, major points of it. So to give you a little background of risk assessments, um, in corrections, we have this governing paradigm, which has been existed for about um, 20 years. And, um, you know, in criminal justice, there is kind of this disconnect between the practitioners and the academics. But in the past 20 years, um, the government um, with federal grants and um, the work of academics trying to get out in the field and actually go into prisons and correctional facilities has tried to gap that bridge. Um, so the governing paradigm that we have, it's called the principles of effective intervention. These are interventions that are effective in reducing recidivism or reoffending um, in, um, you know, in offenders. Um, there are three of the main ones. There's about 14 principles, but the main ones are the risk, need, and responsivity. Um, the risk principle tells us who we should focus our treatment upon um, and what research says. And this is mainly grounded theory. This is theory that came up from observations over a course of about 45 years. Um, data and studies were collected and they came up with the principles of effective interventions. They saw in trends um, and evaluations of correctional programs what worked and what didn't work in reducing recidivism. So the risk principle um, tells us that we should focus our um, efforts on high risk offenders. Um, and if you even look at you know, yourself, if you got into trouble somehow, you would be considered a very low offender, very low risk offender. You probably have a supportive family, you're going to school, you have, um, you know, a schedule, you have things that you're doing with your life, and those um, keep you from offending. Um, so the, the, the principles of effective intervention say that we should focus our money and our programs only on high risk offenders, those who don't have a family that um, you know, supports them, those who have a substance abuse maybe, those who have antisocial attitudes, those who have no employment or cannot keep an employment, those who have um, families maybe that have been abusive to them, all those, those increase the risk of somebody to reoffend, right? Um, so somebody that is low risk, which a lot of times we focus our treatment in, you know, into them because those are the success stories. And as practitioners, you know, everybody likes to see success stories. Nobody wants to deal with the difficult, you know, person or the difficult child, right? Um, what research says is you actually should focus on those difficult people and those high risk offenders, and you should not focus on the low risk ones. The need principle says, um, tells us what we should target. And a lot of times, and you might start noticing this now if you haven't before, or if you're not familiar with this, um, is that a lot of programs um, in corrections, we have for some reason, um, you know, gone on the way of what makes us feel good. So you will see programs such as, oh, I don't know, cake decorating or, you know, um, yoga or, um, you know, planting trees that are targeted to reduce offender recidivism. Unfortunately, why, while those sound very inventive and a lot of fun for the offenders, and you can sure do those, you know, on the side, you need to focus on what makes somebody a criminal, what are called criminogenic needs. Those things are things such as substance abuse, um, antisocial attitudes, you know, having antisocial friends, like hanging out with other criminals, uh, not being able to keep a job, not having a job, not having stable housing, all those kind of things are the criminogenic needs. And the theory tells us that we need to focus on those. 
The responsivity, or the treatment principle, tells us how we should do this treatment. So for example, just like students have different ways of learning things, um, offenders have uh, individual characteristics that can um, make them absorb or reject treatment. So you cannot um, put an offender in a highly, uh, an offender that is, for example, low functioning or with low IQ in a treatment program that is very high structured, high participation, all that kind of stuff. They're not only are they not going to profit and or, you know, get anything from it, but they might feel very intimidated because they don't understand what is happening a lot of the times. Or you cannot put somebody who's got anxiety disorders in a um, program that tends to confront their members and, you know, the things that they're doing wrong. So, um, because this is almost like the medical model, right? When you think about it, you, you have an offender in front of you, what the, the principles of effective interventions um, says is that you should assess their risk. Are they high, low, medium, you know, in between. You should see what their factors that increase their risk scores are, and you should target those th you know, through programming. The risk assessment becomes the, the first kind of major thing that we need to do. So in the past two decades, especially in the last decade, with the help of federal grants and all that, a lot of correctional agencies have implemented what are called this risk assessment um, tools or risk assessment scores. And um, because they're so widely used now, there's also some controversy that has um, risen around them. So, um, actually, even Eric Holder in 2014 um, came out and um, were, was talking about risk assessments in, I think, one of the addresses that he made to the, his department. And he kind of cautioned, again, that a few risk assessments might increase, um, you know, African American involvement or give them um, higher sentences or longer sentences in the system. So, in a response to that, and even prior to that, there's been studies that have examined the predictive validity of risk assessments. What is a predictive validity? It just means is the tool um, good at predicting what it says. It, it will predict. In this case, it's reoffending, right? And at the same time, is it predicting it the same for males, females, for, for African Americans, for Hispa Hispanic, for, you know, um, Caucasians? Because you want it to be valid with all populations, right? You don't want it to predict a higher risk for African Americans than for, um, you know, Caucasians, because that would mean that we were, by using that, we would put more African Americans, you know, in, in prison. Does it make sense? So, um, the research findings on the topics have been kind of mixed because it depends on which risk assessment tool was being examined. There's plenty of these tools circulating out there. Um, the current one, the one that myself and Dr. Settlemeyer, my colleague, looked um, into is called the Level of Service Inventory. And this is the revised ver version because there was one that came out in 1990 and then they, they revised this. Um, so it's uh, commonly called the LSIR. It's used, it came from Canadian psychologists. They are the ones that came up with it um, after many, many years of studies. And they are the ones who also came up with the principles of effective intervention. So it's used widely across the United States and even in other countries. Um, it's used in different points of the criminal justice system, so it can be used to assess risk at intake into a correctional facility, it can be used to um, assess risk while somebody is being released on parole, right, or probation. So at sentencing, it's used at all, um, you know, areas. So um, there's about 54 items that are in this um, tool. 54 items means 54 questions um, that you ask. And there are 10 different kind of subscales, right? So 10 different sections um, 
of these items. And when you look at them, they're looking at things like, and these are you know, things that can be criminogenic then, they're looking at things like criminal history, so did this person have a prior record, right? Um, was this person, you know, employment and education? And what we find out is that a lot of offenders tend to quit school around um, 10th grade. Does anybody want to guess why? What happens in 10th grade? The hormones kick in. Those two, but there is another reason, kind of legal, yeah. You're allowed to drop out of school. You're allowed to drop out, um, you know, from school. So that shows a, a history of kind of antisocial behavior, nonconformist behavior, right? Um, it looks into employment history. Um, a lot of offenders tend to not be able to stay employed for a whole year. Um, financial problems, family and marital, if they have an antisocial um, family as well, if they have a problematic family. Uh, accommodations um, relates to their um, housing. If they live in a high crime neighborhood, th that you know poses a risk because then they're around other people who commit crime. Um, how they spend their time? Do they have hobbies, or do they mostly just hang around smoking weed? Right, um, which a, a lot of the answers will be those. Or I, you know, we just hang out and smoke weed and play video games. Those are not. Um, pro-social you know activities you should have some hobbies you should have structured um, time behavior companions who you hang with right um, it looks into alcohol and drug problems um, whether this person has had it um, or currently has a problem with drugs and alcohol emotional and personal um, this would be a history of mental health um, issues and then how they feel like attitudes, um, pro-social or anti-social attitudes. An anti-social person, I'll give you, because I keep mentioning this, so I'll give you an example of a pro-social um, attitude and an anti-social attitude. And all of us, so don't start, you know, don't think that you're an anti-social person if you thought, had these thoughts before, but all of us tend to have anti-social thoughts and anti-social attitudes. The problem is when you start acting out on those. So I'll give you an example of a pro-social way and an anti-social way of dealing with things. Let's say that you're driving to school and you are speeding because you know that you need 45 minutes to find parking here once you get here, right? So you're speeding on the highway and a cop pulls you over and you have class in an hour, so you need to get out of there. You get angry and the second the officer comes to your window, you start, you know, yelling and saying, I cannot believe this. I am a student. I'm trying to better myself. Um, you know, everybody else was going the same speed. I don't understand why you singled me out. And um, you should go out there and catch real criminals. Why are you dealing with me? I'm actually a college student. I'm trying to do better for myself. That would be an antisocial way of dealing with things. So what happens is usually the officer can double the price of your ticket, right? And then you end up having to go to court. Um, a pro-social way of dealing with that, while getting a ticket is definitely not our, you know, nobody's favorite thing, right? Uh, would be to pull over, abide by the rules, roll your window, be, be polite to the officer, and understand that at the end of the day, Yes, it's not the best thing that happened to you, but the person was just doing their job. So, and you're speeding at the end of the day, right? So those are pro and antisocial attitudes. And um, criminals tend to have a lot of antisocial attitudes and a lot of thinking errors, right? Where they interpret things, they minimize their faults and all those things. So, now that you are, you know, a little more familiar with the LSI, um, we know that the LSI has been validated in different population. What does that mean? To validate a tool means to uh, make sure that it predicts what it says it's predicting with different populations. Men, women, African American, Hispanic, Caucasian, all of those, right? That is doing a good job in predicting recidivism with all of those, or antisocial behavior with all of those. Um, there's been meta-analysis too, which are studies of studies where they gather all the studies done on a topic and then they come up with what is the average effect size, right? And all those. Um, 
And it was designed to be used, it was kind of like a general, it's considered a general um, recidivism um, tool, assessment tool. Um, but the studies that were done on it to validate it, unfortunately, were mostly done with white male populations. So now the critics of it say, you cannot say that this is a general tool when actually, you know, it's only mostly the studies that you've had have been with white male populations. So what about the other groups, right? So the question before us today is, is the LSI equally predictive for all the other populations, for males, for women, for, for, for um, Caucasian, African Americans, and all those populations? To date, as far as we know, and we scoured the literature on this, there has been only about five studies that have examined the predictive validity of this tool. The first one was in 2006, and I have these in chronological um, rankings, so order. So um, this one, um, Whitaker, he examined the predictive validity when it comes to race, right? Different um, race groups, whites, blacks, and Hispanics, and looked at a work release facility. He found out that the LSI overclassified and underclassified, depending on the item. So it, um, African Americans more than whites and Hispanics. What that means is that they would be classified as higher risk than they actually were on certain items and lower risk than they actually were, right? So we're seeing discrepancy there when it came to African Americans. However, you can see that his sample was quite small. He only did it with 532 males. Second one, these guys, um, they looked again at race among parolees. Like I said, this is used at different um, points of the criminal justice system. So they've looked also at different populations. Um, it found out, they found out that yes, LSI worked to predict reconviction for African Americans, but it didn't work for Hispanics. So you see a discrepancy there. Again, look at their um, sample size. It's only 446 males. Fast forward to 2008. Um, we see kind of the same discrepancy again, right? Um, they, black offenders were again more likely to be overclassified by the LSI. And um, white and Hispanic offenders were likely to be underclassified, meaning they were actually higher risk than what the LSI was predicting them to be. The sample, again, it's a little larger than the other ones, but it's still just 900 and, you know, just a, under 1,000 males. Um, Chenane and, and all their colleagues, they looked at misconducts, this time in prison, right? And they found that um, LSI worked better for white uh, prisoners than for black prisoners um, or non-white uh, prisoners in predicting misconducts. A misconduct in this case would be kind of like the recidivism, right? You are, um, you're fighting with other people, so it would be like reoffending. The sample here is a little bigger. We have, um, you know, around 3,000 offenders. And the last one that we found was uh, Osterman and Salerno, where what they did is not only did they look at the predictive validity by race, but now they also included gender in it. So they looked at um, white females versus black females, uh, white females versus black females, and white, you know, Hispanic females versus um, white um, females, and all that kind of stuff, kind of the intersection. And again, we find out that the LSI has poor predictive validity when it comes to um, black males. Um, their sample was a lot bigger than the previous study. They, they had 9,454 um, um, offenders, but half of them were male and half of them were female. So if you look at the males, they had about, um, you know, 4,800, 40, yeah, um, 4,700 males. So there's clearly a need to do this with bigger samples. 
Um, myself and Dr. Settlemeyer, who is set, sitting in the back over there, were able to obtain um, a sample, a very large sample of offenders from um, the division of um, probation here. Um, it's court support um, services in Connecticut. And um, they were very gracious with us to let us examine their data that they had accumulated over you know, a period of 2010 and 2012. We went to them and we said, we would like to see if there's any predictive bias. There's been all these articles. There was one in ProPublica that raised the question. And because LSI is widely used you know, all over <coughs> this country, including Connecticut, we'd like to look at it and see. Of course, because they use it, they're very interested in finding out, right? And we're doing this for free. This would be, you know, something that they could would have to pay somebody. But this is why going into this is why you do your internships too. Um, you know, collaboration between practitioners and academics is very important because then we get the publications and the presentations, and they get the actual data that they can use for day-to-day -day practices. So. We got a sample of probationers from Connecticut, um, from, so all probationers from the years 2010 to 2012, and we also got two-year follow-up, right? Um, two and three-year follow-ups for them after release, right? So after they released, they followed them for three years to figure out if they uh, got rearrested, reconvicted, all that kind of stuff. So our sample was 39,751 offenders, which is a lot larger than other studies have had. So this, is, this presents a very good opportunity for us to see, you know, if th what was found in the past was just um, kind of a function of the low sample size, or if this is something that is truly problematic for the LSI. Um, of course, when you get the data after we removed all the incomplete LSIs and everything else, um, all mistakes, we ended up with 37,756 males and female offenders, which it's still a pretty considerable size sample. When we were coding to do the analysis, we gave priority to ethnicity over race. What does that mean? It means that anyone that classified, when they do the questionnaires, just like in the census, um, where they ask the offender and they say, are you, um, would you consider yourself Hispanic, right? And if you've ever done, like taken a survey, you, you're familiar with those questions. Um, no matter if they also chose white or, you know, African American in the scale, if they chose Hispanic, we identified them as Hispanic, right? Um, so we gave priority to the ethnicity versus um, race. Um, and then for the purposes of just this analysis and this presentation, we removed the female offenders. We're actually including all of them for a publication. Um, but for just this presentation, we um, only dealt with the male offenders to kind of go by the old studies. And we ended up with about 29,000 um, males anyway, 28,860. Um, so we did logistic regressions, which, um, and then we, you know, we include all the predictors. So let me just show you. So these are some of the characteristics of our sample, right? N is the number of people, the number of individuals and percentage there. So we had mostly white offenders in our sample, right? Um, and um, I presented the females too, so you know we're going to include all of these uh, females in the next um, study, and that's the that will be the largest um, study done with female offenders when it comes to the LSI to date. Um, most of them were kind of they were kind of split in the middle, right? Um, a, it looks like a third of them are low risk a third moderate, and a third are high risk. And we use the cutoffs that the state of Connecticut uses. We got those. And the mean age is about 35, which if you have ever taken a criminal justice course, know that that is quite an old age for offenders. Usually crime peaks at what age? Who's seated? 17, yes. So 35, that's about double the age. Most of the people have, you know, seized offending by this age. 
Okay, so first we just did um, some t-tests, right? We just wanted to see if there was any difference in how these um, uh, the scale looked for all the different for the three types of ethnicities that we had and we found that actually there's differences on between the races when it came to kind of all the scales on how they um, uh, how they were scored so Chris you can jump in if you if you'd like to interfere at any point <laughs> um, and then we looked at this so the validity of it when it comes to predicting arrest within 24 uh, months of probation. And what you see with an asterisk in it, those are considered significant, right? So we see that for white offenders, the criminal history becomes very important in predicting um, subsequent um, reconviction, but, or rearrest, I'm sorry. And it's also important for blacks and Hispanic offenders, which means that they're, it, the tool is predicting the same for all three groups, right? So there's no discrepancy there. Um, the same thing is happening for education, employment, uh, for education and employment. It's predicting the same way for all of the three groups. Um, you see the same thing for financial. Things kind of get a little interesting here. When it comes to family and marital, it's not really significant. It's not really predicting for Hispanics while it's still predicting for, for whites and blacks, right? Um, and we, you know, if you go through all of them, accommodation seems to be important only for Hispanics and then companions don't seem so important for blacks. So there's some discrepancies in how the tool is predicting recidivism when you break it down by the subscales. However, as you can see, and then we did the same thing if they ever rested. So this is like three years, right? And we did the same thing. Um, again, criminal history and education employment is predicted in the same way, right? You see discrepancies then in the other ones. But there is no, not really any true trend to show that the tool is predicting differently for one race versus another. You see that it hits in certain subscale for certain races, right? But that can be just a function of the characteristics of this specific group. That doesn't mean that the, scale, the, the assessment is actually predicting better for one or the other group. So we did not think that, um, we did not think that there's you know much difference now one of the things here remember i told you about anti-social attitudes right so read this we suspect that there's actually some coding issue with the attitudes meaning coding issue meaning we think that when the officers were doing the risk assessment interviews with the offenders they had a problem they did not really ask the questions well on this attitudes and orientation variable. The reason why is because when you look at the means here, you see that the mean is one point something for all of them. Now, me being very familiar with the scale, I know that that um, subscale it's usually the highest I believe it's about five so for it to have a mean of one it's quite low meaning that all of the offenders are scoring very low on attitudes right on antisocial attitudes however you can see here that the sample is divided very neatly among the three groups so if you had one third of them low, one third of them medium, and one third of them high. How is it that if you have somebody that is a high risk, right, they also have high antisocial attitudes. How is it then that you're seeing this very low means here? So we went back to probation and said, I think we found a problem. I think you have some problems with how they're asking the questions for those and they said you might be right these are people where we did not do quality assurance this the uh, you know the officers were not quality assured on how they were administering the tool but we do have a sample of officers who did get quality assurance so our next step would be to compare 
you know, data from offenders, from risk assessment of offenders who, whose administrator was quality assured when giving the um, risk assessment versus you know, people who weren't. Does that even make sense to you guys? Okay, I feel like I'm deep in nerdville at this point. Okay, so this is kind of very important because it highlights the fact that data can show you so much about the practices in, you know, in, in your facilities. So they thought it was very interesting. Um, the next steps for us are to include the females in the analysis and see, you know, also the breakdown versus genders. Like, is it predictive well enough? So the thing is, though, we did not find issues with bias or issues with predictive validity that the prior um, studies have found. We just found differences in certain scales, but we did not find that. So that just leads us to the, um, the conclusion that most of the findings from previous findings could be maybe a result of how it was coded, how questions were asked, or also because the sample sizes were so small. So when you have small sample sizes, just by chance you can include some, you know, um, outliers in there and it doesn't balance out. And I believe that is it. So if you're still awake, do you have any questions for this? Yeah. Institute, the Tau Institute for Youth yes. Justice. Do you work with them? Um, I do not. I do adult offenders, okay. but um, they do use a version of that. It's called the YSL, which means Youth uh, Level Risk Inventory. Yeah, okay. so they have the youth version of it. Because okay. you said that a lot of these um, offenders start when they're really young, like 17. Uh, a lot of them actually start since they're children. What we see is a lot of antisocial people actually have had like conduct problems. Um, so yes, we do unfortunately have that school to prison pipeline going on. But the adult system is different from the juvenile system. But yeah, well, yeah. I know they're trying to change how these children sure. are sentenced. Sure. Yes, and Connecticut is leading the way. We are closing the I believe the last um, kind of prison for kids that we had here, and they're going to be handled um, differently now so that you truly give these kids a second chance. You know, a lot of them ha come from very problematic backgrounds, and it's kind of inevitable that they get involved in a criminal activity. Yeah. Do you think that the age would have any effect on the predictive validity? Because, for example, I'm not sure how things work in the US, but maybe you're treated differently in the criminal justice system after you turn 20. And you did say that this sample was a bit skewed to older offenders. Yes, however, these were all adult offenders. So because in the United States, once you're 18, you are treated as an adult in the criminal justice um, system, I don't think that matters because you go through the same things. You're treated the same once you hit that 18. Um, we could examine it. It's a good idea. Uh, we could look at it, um, whether it works, I don't know, better for young offenders than, than older. But when you look at those subscales, it doesn't matter when it comes to the age because, you know, you have those antisocial attitudes. You have no jobs. You don't, you, you have no structure, no hobbies. Those are kind of like the same. Americans are more likely to be arrested. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that might impact your, your I think that's an excellent, um, not even a question, a statement. Mm -hmm. I think what it shows m mainly, um, and that is the argument that we made also um, in the article, and that's the argument that a lot of um, scholars who study risk assessments and tend to work on making their prediction better have argued is that what you're actually tapping into when you see differences in this predictive validity, it's actually different, it's structural problems in the American, uh, American um, life fabric, if, if you say, you know, 
there is evidence out there that African Americans do get treated differently from, you know, police. There is evidence, there are studies that show dis uh, discrepancies in how they're sentenced in court. Um, so I'm not sure that it, it's, it's the actual tool as much as the human agent who is, you know, the fact that African Americans tend to have higher um, prior um, histories of, of criminal behavior is also because the fact that they're more likely to be arrested and more likely to be sentenced after arrested to, to prison rather than Caucasians. So what will be your next research project? Will you be building on this one? Or? Yeah, so next we're going to look at females also. Um, and then uh, we did sp speak with probation, and they would like to see if there's a difference between um, uh, risk assessments that have been quality assured, meaning they are delivered the way they're being done the way they're supposed to. So there's fidelity to it, right? It's kind of like taking a medication. Like you're supposed to take it three times a day, you know, for, for two weeks. And if you don't take it that way, then it might, the doctor says it's not going to have any effect on you. Um, the same with correctional treatment and risk assessment and all that. It needs to be done the way, you know, the, the tool says to be done. And a lot of practitioners try to get creative. They don't like an aspect of it, so they don't want to do it. And so that's what we, we found, that they're not asking those questions correctly, right? So it would be interesting to see the differences between when the tool was actually administered as it's supposed to versus just how people do it every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys do this assessment? Like, is it like paper or? Um, this, um, I believe they do it electronically now, but it used to be paper. So I've done a ton of these because um, I go to prisons for fun and um, I, uh, I've done a ton of these and it was pen and paper. So you ask the questions, you make the notations and then you score it later on your own. How do you isolate any effects that let's say prisons puts them through a program before they are, they are released and then received? It? So are there any like, effects that the program might have caused on your data? So they would be a lower risk, right? If the program worked, they would actually They, they're supposed to do that. Yeah. Now, we uh, coming, that's what I do for a living. We know that a lot of states are not doing that. That's what we're working now to. In the past 10 years, that's what we've been working really hard to get implemented. The fact that, you know, they need to, to put people into programming based on their risk score, not because they feel like it. Um, but that does not make a difference in the predictive validity of a risk assessment because it would just, let's say you got put into a program and it actually worked and it lowered your risk score, then you would just be categorized as lower risk. That wouldn't have any impact in how the tool works in predicting it. Does that make sense? How long is the test? The assessment? So, you, it. I can do one in around 35 minutes. You should take about 45 minutes to an hour. Because you shouldn't just be like, so how's your relationship with your parents? Good? Okay. You know, you should actually probe and say, because people will say good. Okay, well, can you elaborate on that? Um, do you talk to them often? Well, I haven't talked to my mom in like five years. And, you know, you'd be surprised. People don't, well, that's not a good relationship, right? Like there's definitely strain there. Or... Um, do you feel like you have a drug problem? No. Okay, moving on. No, that's not how you do it, right? Like, okay, so tell me a little bit, like, um, when's the last time you drank alcohol? Oh, I drink every day. How much do you drink? Well, usually a six pack or so. <coughs> Anything else? I also smoke weed every day. Okay, well, that is definitely, you definitely have some substance abuse issues, right? I mean, you laugh, but it's truly like <laughs> what you hear. Um, yeah, so it's important that the officer is trained and they have trainings for this and there's a whole fidelity process that goes into it. And depending on how tired you are at your job, you ask those probing questions to get good or you're like, no, okay, and you just move on. A lot of probation officers, obviously, they want to help people. You don't become a probation officer because you don't want to help people or you want to become rich. So... Um, 
you know, a lot of them are invested. It's just having to do it correctly and getting enough training and all those. And the federal government with the Second Chance Act, I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Um, this month is actually President Trump designed, um, designated um, uh, April as a Second Chance Act, um, a Second Chance Act um, month. But the Second Chance Act gives uh, money to a lot of correctional agencies to implement reentry services for a lot of offenders who are incarcerated because in the 90s we really filled our prisons and jails and um, there's there's a whole lot of people coming back to the communities because 95 percent of offenders come back to the communities after being incarcerated so we have a lot of people coming back now and they don't have the skills they don't have the the right attitudes they don't have jobs so with the Second Chance Act, um, the federal government has given this year, I think it's about 87 million to programming for reentry. And it just got reapproved, so. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tim. You're welcome. <laughs>